Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we have an interview with Josh Cotton, who is a paleo artist at the Brigham Young University Museum, some dinosaur news, and a discussion about Ultrasaurus and Ultrasauros. <laughs> So first in the news, some workmen in China found 43 dinosaur eggs while they were laying sewage pipe. 19 of those eggs were fully intact, and they've been given to experts to study at the Huyang Dinosaur Museum, since it was discovered in the city of Huyang, which is in southeast China. The eggs were about 4 to 5 inches in diameter, Apparently, one worker tried to take off with two of the eggs, but he was stopped, and he ended up running away empty-handed. And so some people formed a human chain to protect the site till police came and the eggs were able to be taken out to be examined. The curator of the museum, Du Yanli, said, quote, There were fossilized dinosaur eggs everywhere in the red sandstone layer, but they were never found because the city was built on top of the layers. The Huyang Dinosaur Museum said that since dinosaur eggs were first discovered in China in 1996, there have been more than 17,000 fossilized dinosaur eggs found. This museum has one of the largest dinosaur egg collections in the world, and the city Huyang has now dubbed itself as China's home of dinosaurs. In Australia, a farmer in Queensland found a nearly complete jaw of Kronosaurus, which isn't a dinosaur, but this story sounded cool enough to share. The jaw is about five feet long from a Kronosaurus queenslandicus and it's more than 100 million years old. Kronosaurus was a reptile with a crocodile-like head and it had powerful flippers and the man who found this fossil, Robert Haken, said that he had been spraying for weeds on his cattle property but they'd had a drought and it killed the grass and that's how he was able to see the bone. Actually he accidentally drove over it. Dr. Tim Holland, who's the museum curator of the Kronosaurus Corner Museum in Richmond, where the fossil's been on display this week, said that most Kronosaurus jawbones that have been found were either damaged or eroded or incomplete. So this is the most complete one found so far. And if you're wondering what a Kronosaurus looks like, if you've seen the new Jurassic World trailer, the big aquatic dinosaur looking thing that comes jumping out of the sea world type attraction to grab the in-air food is a chronosaurus or looks just like what a chronosaurus would have looked like and now for our interview with josh cotton a paleo artist currently working at the brigham young university museum of paleontology updating illustrations and videos for their exhibits he has also done a piece for the Dinosaur Journey Museum in Fruta, Colorado, and has an illustration in the book Dinosaurs and Other Reptiles from the Mesozoic of Mexico, edited by Hector Rivera Silva et al. You can see his work on his website, joshcotton.com, as well as the BYU Museum of Paleontology YouTube channel and the BYU Facebook page. And Josh and the museum has kindly allowed us to embed a special video made from the 70s that shows Jim Jensen, the founder of the Brigham Young University Museum. And when we post the show notes, be sure to look out for that video. So we met because you sent us an email that we had made a mistake in one of our episodes about Taurosaurus, which we would like to correct. <laughs> so I did a little more research on it. I knew a little bit more about it, but I was a lot more familiar with the Brontosaurus debates and everything mm -hmm. <laughs> than Taurosaurus. So That's exciting stuff too. Yes, especially <laughs> that it's it might be back. <laughs> yeah, we actually had uh, Octavio Mateus, one of the uh, one of the authors on that paper, he came down and studied some of our collections for for his paper. Didn't realize that's what he was doing at the time, but, but yeah. Got to meet him briefly before I didn't get to talk a ton with him, but it was neat to watch him work. Cool. So for people who might not be familiar, there's a debate on whether Taurosaurus is a mature version of Triceratops or it's its own species. And some scientists say that Taurosaurus may just be an adult Triceratops and they're known as the lumpers, and others are saying it might be its own species and they're known as the splitters. 
Josh, could you tell us a little bit your thoughts about it? Yeah, you know, the Torosaurus and Triceratops debate is really interesting, I think, and useful especially because it, it draws attention to the fact that different people of equal qualification in the sciences can have different opinions. And, you know, when I wrote the email to you, to you guys, it wasn't necessarily to say that, you know, Jack Horner is wrong in saying that Torosaurus is uh, an adult Triceratops. He could very well be right. But my issue was that it's still under debate. And when talking with scientists, they'll talk this way sometimes when speaking with the public, but almost never when talking with scientists will you hear someone say that something has been proven or something, you know, you hear scientists say in the movies all the time, it is scientifically proven, that, you know, and, you know, real scientists always snicker when they hear that because they're very careful in their language not to use that word proven, but they'll say it's generally accepted or strongly supported. And because... In science in general, but especially with dinosaurs, there's nothing that's clear-cut. There's nothing that we know for sure. There's strong evidence that points us in different directions and helps us restore dinosaurs to the best of our ability. But there's a lot of things that we just don't know. And, you know, there's in Triceratops and Taurosaurus, there's strong evidence that Dr. Horner talks about that they could be different growth stages of the same animal. He points out that they lived in the same area. He points out that out of the specimens that he studied, it seems that the Torosaurus ones are bigger and older and the Triceratops ones are younger and smaller as determined by cross sections of the bone. He actually slices the bone and checks the texture to find out how old they are. And there's also just been a history in paleontology of oversplitting. My wife and I right now are actually, we're reading a book by Peter Dodson called The Horned Dinosaurs. And we just read about Things like 14 different species of Triceratops that Othniel Marsh named when now we're down to two, (laughs) you know, and they would change the species name on any little anatomical detail or if they just found a different part of the animal or, you know, and that's part of where the brontosaurus debate comes into is actually Marsh and Cope that were involved in that, Marsh in particular. But on the other side of the Taurosaurus debate, though, there's people who are really digging in their heels and saying, no, 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 this is a different animal. And... You know, there's some sentimentality to that. And to me, too, you know, I feel sentimentally attached to Taurosaurus. That's a really cool name. It's a really cool dinosaur. It's a really cool statue outside the Peabody Museum. And, you know, it's tough to lay those feelings aside, but they have some strong evidence as well. They looked at a different set of specimens, and they found some Taurosaurus individuals that weren't completely mature, meaning that they wouldn't have been the oldest growth stage. They used kind of a different way of telling whether they are mature or not than Jack Horner did. And there's a few other lines of evidence as well, you know, in the northern states, or well, actually in the central states, you'll find Taurosaurus and Triceratops together. In the northern states, you'll find a lot of Triceratops and very few Taurosaurus. And in the southern states, some of the material is, is still kind of limited. You know, there needs to be more research done, but it seems that you really only find Taurosaurus in the southern states. So it wouldn't really make sense for if it's just an older version of, of Triceratops to only find the old guys down there. And again, you know, we're dealing with a fossil record, which is a limited sample and has biases that we can't predict. The other thing is there are some anatomical differences aside from just being big. Taurosaurus has a different number of bones than Triceratops does, and it does consistently have a different number of what they call the epoxipitals, which are these little bony attachments to the frill. Triceratops has one in the center and then a certain number coming out on the side, and then Taurosaurus never has one in the center and always has 10 to 12 on the outside. What about Horner's, one of his arguments was because, you know, you change as you get older and stuff, and they had cited an, uh, was it a Netoceratops as possibly being the in-between stage, although I know some scientists said, like, actually, this was probably just a sick dinosaur, so that's why it looked different, but... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, looking at the at the skull for that animal, it seems that what they're describing as transitional holes are, are probably pathological, pathological meaning that they didn't come there by the normal natural means. It was because it was sick or injured. You know, we call it pathological when, say, like on Sue, when the T-Rex, when Sue was bitten or had bones broken and they'd heal and they'd have strange lumps on them because they were healed over. That's what pathological means. Mm. So they think that that animal has pathologies that make those holes, but it's the, so I, I wouldn't say that that's his strongest piece of evidence. He's got other ones that are stronger. And, you know, he's done a lot of great work in other sorts of animals. Younger Triceratops, showing that some of these smaller animals that used to be split off and as their own species, uh, because they were smaller and their horn shape was different, it turns out that they were just immature Triceratops and would agree with them there. Or also the combining of 
Pachycephalosaurus, the big, thick-headed, head-butting dinosaur. There were three different genuses called Stegosaurus, not Stegosaurus, Stegosaurus, Stygimoloch, and Pachycephalosaurus, uh, with different shapes on, of their heads and different sizes. But he was able to tell, based on the cross-sections of the bone, that the head shape was changing as it was growing up, and that these other animals that had been found were young, they were juveniles. So those have been kind of combined those three very different looking animals into one genus. And it seems like that's a pretty solid argument that he's got there. But I don't think it's quite as strong with the Taurosaurus and Triceratops. Because they looked so different that it doesn't seem... I don't think the two animals were extremely different. But the thing is, when you're trying to change the generally accepted beliefs in science, the burden of proof lies with you. And not to say that, you know, again, we can't prove anything, but... There needs to be overwhelming evidence in order to split them, to shift them. And I think there's just enough evidence both ways right now that uh, you can kind of choose what you want to believe. And, you know, again, that's where the sentimentality comes in. You know, I choose to believe in Taurosaurus because I think it's just a really cool animal, a really cool name. But trying really hard to, to stay open to any further evidence. Sure. Have any mature Triceratops been found? Absolutely. Lots of mature Triceratops have been found. And that's part of the issue is I had sent you guys a video of a debate between Jack Horner and another scientist at Yale. And they were talking about how some of the individuals of Triceratops that they found seemed like they were older and had bones that were more fused and they were more mature than some of the specimens of Taurosaurus that they found or, or had access to that Dr. Horner didn't have access to. So it would seem that there were just two very large herbivores and that the world was big enough for the two of them. Similar situation to what you find you know, on the uh, African Serengeti today. You know, We've got here on BYU campus, we've got the Bean Museum, the Monty L. Bean Life Science Museum, and there's some great taxiderm mounts of some of these huge, huge African herbivores. Some of them live in the same environment and they're enormous, and some of them have very similar modes of life and are eating some of the same stuff, but you know, there's as much as you know, there's competition between species, there's no hard and fast rule that only one species in a certain niche can live in an environment at a time, especially you know, in a world as plentiful as the late Cretaceous. I thought I had read somewhere that there are a lot more Triceratops specimens than Taurosaurus, and I know part of that could be just we haven't found a lot of Taurosaurus yet, but do you think that adds any weight to the argument that maybe this means they could have been the same? You, you know, that could go two ways. It's difficult when you look at the fossil record to try to make any judgment calls about population. There are these things called preservational biases, which basically means that in some environments, certain things preserve easier than in other environments. So it's going to be easier for something to preserve if it's big. It's going to be easier for something to preserve, for instance, like animals preserve a lot better in some environments than plants do, and plants preserve a lot better in some environments than the animals do. It's difficult to find them both preserved well in the same place. Also, I was talking with Dr. Sheets the other day, it's kind of odd to think, you know, we, we think we've got this big picture of the world of the dinosaurs when really we've got a lot of pictures of river bends and lake shores. <laughs> Those are the places that fossilization took place. We have absolutely no fossils of dinosaurs that lived in the mountain, though we know they must have. And, you know, when you think about animals today, they move to different places at different times of the year. A lot of, you know, migrations happening. And so who's to say that, you know, during the time that the flood season, while these uh, dying animals are washed together and, and their bones are preserved, that maybe that was a, a time of the year that the Taurosaurus had migrated to a different area, you know? So it's tough to make any judgment calls about what an actual population would be like based on the count in the fossil record. You can try, but it's not particularly reliable that way. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess the general takeaway is that there's evidence on both sides, and this is still definitely up for debate, and it's been going on for a while. Uh, Horner and John Scanella presented this hypothesis back in 2009, mm -hmm. and, and it's ongoing. So, all right. So you update illustrations and videos for exhibits at the Brigham Young University Museum of Paleontology, and you have this excellent time-lapse video of a restoration of Camptosaurus. Can you talk a little bit about what was involved in that process? Absolutely. You know, there's been some really great tools that have opened up to paleontologists recently, and the tool in particular that I use for the restoration of Camptosaurus is a, a program called ZBrush. 
Uh, there's a lot of different 3D programs that paleontologists are using lately. 3D scanning, different things like that. But this program is actually something that's used in Hollywood for movie making to create creatures for the big screen. Uh, it's what they use to create the creatures in James Cameron's Avatar. It's what's been used to do some of the more recent stuff on The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. But what's great about these tools being developed for entertainment and be able to bring these animals to almost breathing life, we're able now to turn around and use these same techniques and apply them instead to, to science and paleontology and try to get a better picture of things. And about how long does it take you to do something like that? It really depends on the creature that I'm restoring, how much material that we have of it, how much detail we want to go into. Fortunately for, for Camptosaurus, there's a lot of material for Camptosaurus, a lot of different skeletons that have been found all over the place. And we even have one mounted and up on display in the museum, so I was able to go take pictures and, and reference from him. Usually, if you know fairly solidly what the animal's going to look like, uh, it, it'll take a day. If you're breaking some new ground, and I'm talking in ZBrush, but there's other, like painting one would take quite a bit longer, actually. But if there's less certainty about what the animal would look like, it might take a few days or, or a week if you're doing a life restoration, or it could take longer if you're really trying to go in depth and be really rigorous about your anatomy. But a lot faster than a lot of the previous tools that have been available. Yeah, but you use a mix of tools, right? You draw and you also do some other can you talk about the other kinds of mediums absolutely you know I, I think you know the, the foundation of everything i do including the the work that i do in 3d is drawing it's really important to draw and you learn with your hands as much as you do with your eyes and as much as you do through reading and hearing and i love to draw on pencil and pen and marker and some of those are, are finished pieces as well you know I've, I've got some some pen pieces up in the museum of uh an iguanodont and a mosasaur it was pronated on i think it was but yeah, and in addition to drawing, I do a lot of digital painting uh, in a program called Photoshop. You guys are probably all familiar with that, which is kind of funny. It's, it's a, a program that was originally intended just for photo manipulation, but artists really latched onto it, especially with the advent of, of pen tablets, and it's kind of taken off and become the industry standard for what's used to do concept paintings for film and animation now. So how often do exhibits at the museum need to be updated? It's important to update an exhibit whenever there is a change in our understanding of the dinosaurs. At first, there was just a lot of updating to be done all around. You know, there are a lot of fantastic scientists and artists who have worked at the Museum of Paleontology over the last 40 years since Jim Jensen founded it. But our understanding has changed a lot since then. Our understanding has even changed quite a bit since the release of Jurassic Park. You know, But those are the dinosaurs that everybody still imagines. So there's a lot of changing of some of the displays that way and even some of the stuff that I've done since working starting work at the Museum of Paleontology you know, three or four years ago even some of that stuff has is, is already gone out of date I mentioned the, the iguanodont and, and the mosasaur the pronithodont and both of those you know are nice drawings but unfortunately I shouldn't say unfortunately it's fortunate that we learn new stuff <laughs> but you know our understanding is updated so that you know we found some trackways of animals related to our iguanodont, and it turns out that the scientists who published these trackways showed that their wrists are oriented in a little bit different way than what I had restored. So that one needs updating now. Also, the mosasaur it turns out that mosasaur skin impressions that have now been found don't have all the the crazy spiky scales that I had restored this particular one with. I kind of give it some alligator type armor. You know, it turns out they have much smoother, more pebbly scales, and so. That one needs to be updated as well. So, yeah, it's it's always changing. And that's part of what's exciting about it. It you know, keeps the imagination going and, and realizes that nothing's permanent, but that we're striving towards restoring these things, and the work's never done. <laughs> so you mentioned Jurassic Park, so I have to ask, what are your thoughts on the upcoming movie? And also, I know they're, they're incorporating some of the new things scientists have figured out about dinosaurs in the last 20 years, but not everything yet. <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I love... The original Jurassic Park, not as big a fan as the second movie. I love the third one. Not everybody likes that one, but I liked it. And I think, you know, I can understand for working, as I do both in entertainment and in science, wanting there to be continuity between films. I can understand that. And also, the idea of feathered dinosaurs is kind of old hat to science, but a little bit newer to the public. That's been kind of slow on the uptake. And a lot of the artwork that has been done of them been people who were trying to express that dinosaurs had feathers but haven't had much time to explore how feathers work on birds. 
and really it's been difficult to get to the point where we get those drawings that look good. So a lot of people think feather dinosaur, that's not scary. That's not fun, you know. But I think they're, you know, some artists though are starting to really uh, get it and get some nice reconstructions out. But you know, I, I think as a PR decision, I can understand why they would do that as well. So you know, a lot of people say it's just a movie, and it is that. As much as I can understand and respect the decisions that they made in terms of uh, PR and in terms of continuity with previous films, I am a bit disappointed because you know the spirit of the first movie was we had this old image of dinosaurs. Here's the new science being brought to light. Here's the first time the public is exposed to these animals and all their glory and bleeding edge of what we know to be correct. You know, obviously there were some issues even known at that time, but it was largely correct for the knowledge at the time. And that was the spirit of Michael Crichton, the author of the book too. You know, he passed away unfortunately a couple of years ago, but I can I, I loved his books in high school. I don't know how many times I read both Jurassic Park and The Lost World. And whether I was reading those books or some of his other ones that were about other branches of science, it was really important to him to create a fantasy world that you could believe. You know, anytime you go to a film, you've got your, what they call the willing suspension of disbelief. You say, I know this is a movie, but I'm going to pretend it's not. I'm going to let myself get swept up in the story. What Michael Crichton was really good at was making that barrier so thin. He was really good at saying, this isn't real, but it could be. <laughs> you know, and you come out of Jurassic Park looking over your shoulder to see if, you know, if there's a raptor behind you. For me, there's going to be a, a much bigger barrier looking at, at this new film where they've chosen not to update with the current understanding. I'm, I have to put all that baggage away. In order to believe the film, I have to say, okay, these raptors don't have feathers, but even though real raptors did, but I'm going to pretend they don't, you know. And it's just going to be, at that point, at least for people who know about dinosaurs, it becomes a story issue and not just an aesthetic issue. It becomes, I have a harder time believing it. And, I, and also, I, I don't think that particular decision does as much credit to the memory of Michael Crichton, because I think he would have wanted to make it as accurate as possible. How did you get your start into paleo art? What's your background? What's my background? How far back do I go? <laughs> as far back as you feel like sharing. <laughs> I think every kid loves dinosaurs. When I was really little, I wanted to be a, a Ninja Turtle. It turns out that BYU didn't offer a major in being Ninja Turtle. But I had... A, the opportunity when I was, I think, about third grade, and, you know, and enjoyed dinosaurs just like any other kid. But at that time, Dr. Robert Bacher, who was the, one of the first guys to really popularize the idea of warm-blooded dinosaurs, he was working in Wyoming at that time and, and visited my school district and gave a presentation up on stage. And it was just so exciting to listen to in this picture that he would paint of the, of the prehistoric world. And I got really excited. And and he was really patient with after his presentation was over and let, let me talk to him for quite a while and actually sent me away with a cast of a theropod tooth and a sauropod tooth, which is very kind of him, but that kind of put a match to, to the gasoline. And after that, I knew I, I wanted to do paleo art. I wanted to, or well, I, at that time I thought I was a paleontologist, but I realized later on that what I really enjoy is, is drawing them. You know, I think that's at the root of the passion. And then after that, my family was just incredibly, incredibly supportive, both my parents, I don't know if they thought I would end up in, in paleontology or not, but they loved me and they loved my sisters and they just supported us in whatever we wanted to do. They took us on trips sometimes specifically, you know, we'd, we'd drive for hours to go to a museum or, you know, we're in the, the middle of nowhere in Wyoming, but, you know, we'd travel and we'd go to the Wyoming Dinosaur Center in Thermopolis or the uh, Hot Springs Mammoth site in South Dakota. Or I can remember one time my mom took me all the way it was just a trip for us to go to Dinosaur National Monument when I was 12, and I got my first copy of the Dinosauria there, and they're just really, really supportive, but a debt of gratitude to them. And then, you know, got to, towards the end of high school, and you know, I had wanted to be a paleontologist, wanted to be a paleo artist, but I started to get this sense of how are you going to contribute to the world, you know, realizing that the world has all these problems, and started to think that maybe it would be a little bit selfish of me to take my life and devote them to this thing that, you know, a lot of people would consider, you know, childish or just play. <laughs> and I thought I was into filmmaking and thought, you know, maybe if I go into film and animation and try to put out good messages and create good role models in the media for kids, that that would create a, a bigger impact, which is why I majored in illustration with animation emphasis here at BYU, entertainment design. And I still intended to do that, but when I got to BYU, I stopped by the Dinosaur Museum here across the street from the football stadium and noticed that 
there was a lot of fantastic material on display. Uh, there's a lot of really neat cutting edge research going on, but a lot of the illustrations were really old, done by great artists and scientists in the past, but a lot of the stuff was really old and needed to be updated. And I was looking for a job, <laughs> and I had taken a class from Dr. Brooks Britt and visited with him and visited with our curator, Dr. Rodney Sheets, and they were kind enough to, to bring me on to, to update these exhibits and also to help them with illustrating things for their new research. And I enjoyed that, but I thought it was this was just you know kind of a thing that I was doing to help get through college, but didn't think that that was you know necessarily how I wanted to make an impact on the world. But we had a little boy visit our museum with the Make a Wish program, and he was which if you're not familiar with Make a Wish or similar programs, it's basically these kids you know they're they're really ill they're and it looks like they might not have long, but we want to make the rest of the time that they've got good time you know. And so they make a wish, and the foundation does their best to make it happen. Some of the kids you know, want to be an astronaut or want to be Batman or, or want to do all these things. What, what this little boy wanted to do was he wanted to be a paleontologist. He loved dinosaurs. And so he came to our museum, and Dr. Britt took him out on a dig up near Dinosaur National Monument. He got to dig on this cool new late Triassic stuff. And then he came to the museum and got to help work on preparing some of the dinosaur bones and then he and I got to visit and draw dinosaurs together a little bit and stayed in contact with him and with his family afterward. Also another person working at the museum did as well, Ryan Chambers, and kind of became pen pals <laughs> with his family. And it was a, a roller coaster ride for them and for us the next couple of years. And, you know, they fought a long fight against cancer and eventually he passed away. Um, but during that whole time, one of the things that really excited him that, that really made life happy and exciting and, and put the spark back in him was dinosaurs. And uh, sometimes he'd send me a letter and ask, you know, could you send me a drawing of this this week? And I'd, I'd send it back to them and they'd send me a, a picture online that he'd colored it in. And, <laughs> and it was just a, a really beautiful experience. And I gradually realized more and more that, you know, maybe there is a point to dinosaurs. You know, you'll hear scientists a lot of times when they're asked if there's a point, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, uh, animals are going extinct today, you know, and we need to know about the history of the world so that we can figure out how to make predictions for the future, which is true. I mean, there's some truth to that. But I think even more than that, dinosaurs are just beautiful and amazing, and they give us the opportunity to connect with each other, and, and particularly with children, in a way that we couldn't otherwise. It inspires kids to get into the sciences and to create good lives for their families. And it was a great thing for for this family, you know, to a way that he could be happy even though his situation was really dark. So that kind of galvanized me and helped me realize that, okay, you know, I'll still try to be doing work in the entertainment industry, but I always want to work with dinosaurs because there's a point to dinosaurs. That's amazing and really great that you're able to do that, combine things that you love and also helping people. It's a blessing. We still get to talk to them every now and then. Not so much lately. I need to write them a letter. <laughs> but... Yeah, really, really blessing. Very inspirational for people who might be looking to start a career that somehow involves dinosaurs. You know, there's a quote, and I'll, I'll probably botch the quote here, but my sister shared with me once that you don't look at the, when you're deciding what to do with your, with your life, don't look at the world and decide to do with your life based on what the world needs. Find out what makes you kind of come alive, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I, I think that's going to be a way that a lot of these other needs of the world are going to be fulfilled. Because if, you know, people care enough about each other through their other interests, and then they're going to work to solve those problems. So as a paleo artist, do you have to have any kind of science background to make sure that you're accurate in your portrayals? You know, it's important to study up, to know your stuff as much as you can, but... That's the great thing about working with scientists is, you know, you do everything you can and you, and you present it to them. And then if there's something wrong with it, they can say, okay, you know, this is good, but you need to turn his wrist around or you need to do this or that, you know. And you learn from them and then they learn from the questions that you ask them because, you know, you, you ask different questions when you're drawing than you do when you're writing. So it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship. But definitely if you want to be a paleontologist or a paleo artist, I would recommend, you know, study up, you know, do well in school and uh, particularly for paleo art, learn about animal anatomy. And it might surprise you, but 
learn about human anatomy, learn about drawing the human figure. Because if you can draw the human figure, you can draw anything. Is it because it's so complicated? Because it's so complicated, and because you know, one of the beautiful things about the way God has designed nature is that there's a lot of repetition in the way that forms work. So that's one of the things that I've learned studying art at BYU is that we think of our bodies as, as machines and we'll hear about them that way in, in science. Here's how this chemical reaction works. Here's how this muscle works and different things. But also nature is constrained to design principles. And those things are consistent across you know, the human form to the animal form to plant form. You'll see similar things happen. And also, if you understand really well how to draw the human figure, and you understand both human anatomy really well, and you understand dinosaur anatomy really well, then you can kind of transpose and apply it as you're drawing. And in kind of a weird way, use yourself as reference. <laughs> you know, be able to, you know, one thing you've learned in illustration animation, they talk about, you know, if you're having trouble drawing something that's moving, get up and move. If you're trying to get the emotion of this character, get up and act. And... I think the, the same thing holds true to dinosaurs, but it's funny, you know, you'll, you'll watch animators, you know, they'll be drawing and they'll be working and they'll be quiet with their nose to the grindstone and then all of a sudden they'll get up and be dancing around and then sit back down and be somber and quiet again. You know, I think, you know, you, you apply those same things to dinosaurs, you get a lot more energy and a lot more interest and excitement that way. So do you sometimes have to get up and start acting like a T-Rex or some other kind of, di whatever dinosaur you're working on? I may incriminate myself here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, Every now and then, you know, you, you just have to get up and move to get the pose right. That's I know that's weird, but no, you know, it's, fun. It's, it's fun, though. It's fun. And, you know, I've actually, I've got a friend, Austin Andrus, who's, he's actually a really good artist in his own right, but he works with the BYU Museum of Paleontology, recently graduated, doing some cool stuff on a new lizard lately. But he combined, and this is, I think, key, whatever your discipline is, study what you're doing but also study other stuff. Keep an open mind and try to incorporate everything because everybody in every discipline has something to teach everybody else in every, every other discipline. And one of the cool things about Austin is that he, in addition to science, has studied dance and really understands motion. I think that helps him with his biomechanics and it also helps him teaching. You know, with little kids, he did this really cool thing where he, he brought them through the museum with dance. <laughs> Just these little kindergartners, you know, and they had so much fun. They were so excited and you know, they were learning with their whole bodies, and you also really learn, okay, uh, you know, lizards move with their legs splayed out to the side. Dinosaurs have their legs underneath. You know, the pteranodon flew with its fourth finger, and, you know, if you've done that with your own body, then you remember a lot better. So I think that good to move. Yeah, that makes sense. I know part of your job is to unify the feel of the museum. So what does that entail? How do you do that? One of the important things about... Any visual experience, whether you're talking about a museum, whether you're talking about a book, whether you're talking about a website, whether you're talking about a video game, it's important to unify the colors, unify the typefaces. Because of the nature of, of the way the BYU Museum of Paleontology came about, it was a, a bunch of different scientists and artists and students contributing to it over the course of 40 years. And each person had a little bit different idea of how a science should look, and also science changed over the course of that time, so you'd see different types of... Uh, interpretations of the dinosaurs. Some of our early stuff that's not on display anymore. Actually, some of it is. I need to, but <laughs> you need to replace still. But some of the early stuff, you know, shows the theropod dinosaurs like T. Rex and Allosaurus rearing up back on their tails, which we know they don't do. So updating that, unifying that with our with the modern look, and also you know colors. You know, just like chords and music. If chords aren't quite right, you you can tell if somebody's out of tune when something's discordant. You know. The same thing happens with colors. It's important to have colors that are in harmony and unified through the course of the museum. And the thing is, we, you know, we had all these signs that had been created through different times, a carpet that was brought in after those signs, so it didn't jive quite the same way with them. And so just kind of looking at, okay, what are the colors of the museum? Let's make new signs that work with those colors, that have updated information, that have unified look as far as their typeface and their graphics. And so you go in and you're not distracted by how scattered all the visual styles are, but you're able to have a learning experience. That's interesting. It's definitely something, like as a visitor to the museum, generally probably don't even take that into account or even notice, but it makes a big difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and honestly, you're doing a good job, people don't notice. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just, you know, enjoy, and that's kind of the goal. 
you gave a little bit of a history of the museum. I was wondering if you could expand upon a little bit. I know Jim Jensen. Jensen, yes. Is all good? Yeah, Dinosaur Jim Jensen, as he was known back in the day. Really interesting character. Really interesting character. He worked, after World War II, he helped uh, reconstruct Pearl Harbor, and he was really good with his hands. He was a mechanic. And then he went to Harvard, where he was employed there as kind of a handyman around their museum. He was such a quick learner. He was from Lemington, Utah, by the way, putting a plug for them. Really cool place. But he was a really quick learner, and he, and he fell in love with the dinosaurs, and he had all these great ideas for exhibits and they actually started putting him in charge of the exhibits over at Harvard and he was innovating in different ways that he could mount the dinosaurs and then they started taking him on expeditions because they knew he could fix anything. Uh, He went to Antarctica, he went to Argentina and did some of the first paleontology down there along with some of his cohorts and then he came to to Utah and Brigham Young University which actually interestingly enough is is a religious institution but he came down there and they brought him on to start collecting dinosaurs and he eventually persuaded them to let him build a museum. And the uh, Museum of Paleontology was actually, and still is, an extension of his old lab, so we're still pretty small. But again, a lot of great material. He collected one of the largest and most complete collections of upper Jurassic dinosaur bones in the world. Probably the greatest collector since Barnum Brown. Just a lot of great material, and scientists still come today from all over the world to, to look at our material, like Octavia Mateus, for the recent paper about brontosaurus, about bringing brontosaurus back, he came down and looked at some of our stuff. And yeah, you know, Jim Jensen worked for, ran the Museum of Paleontology for, for many years and, until, you know, he passed away in the, in the late 90s and there have been a couple of other curators since then. Currently it is Dr. Rodney Sheets and he focuses on, on ornithopods, the fleet-footed plant-eating dinosaurs, particularly in the early Cretaceous and we're doing a lot of work on those and also on some early Cretaceous sauropods and late Triassic theropods with Dr. Bay. So what are some of your favorite projects that you've worked on at the museum? I love especially, you know, it's fun working at the museum wet no matter what you're doing because you know it's for dinosaurs. I remember when I first started working and there was a spill on the ground in collections and I started mopping it up and I was just grinning from ear to ear because I was mopping in a dinosaur museum. (laughs) You know, just really excited about that. But so whatever I do is a blast. You know, I'd start out doing some preparation work. I've done some field work on some dinosaur digs. I've done help in research with taking measurements and 3D scans and working with some more recent animals and things like that. But still, my very favorite thing is reconstructing a new animal, followed closely by reconstructing already known animals. (laughs) I love, you know, my parents when I was, well, particularly my mom, she always wondered, you know, we go to a museum and we leave from the gift shop with like a cast of a claw or something. Like, why do you always have to go and come back with this dead stuff? You know, really supportive, but she had a hard time understanding the dead stuff part. But the thing is, it's not dead stuff. It's stuff that used to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I love imagining them alive. And I love when I think about what they would act and putting them, you know, in, in dynamic poses and instances in their life. And I love that special place that happens in, in paleo art where, you know, a lot of art is okay imagination from nothing which is fun too and there's a lot of value in that but what's great about paleo art is you've got this foundation and you've got imagination given these constraints given this skeleton and what we know about dinosaurs from all this other research what do you think it would look like so you try to fill all the holes you try to guess how it would have behaved and colors it would have been and textures and different things like that i think that's a blast i love the uh and also because you know we talked a little bit earlier about jurassic park imagination that you think could be real. You draw a dragon, which I like drawing dragons, but you draw a dragon and you're like, okay, that was fun. I have to try really hard to imagine it's real. With a dinosaur, you think, wow, this could have really been. And uh, it's like living the adventure. Going back quickly, you mentioned that you have been on digs. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences with them? Absolutely. I had the opportunity to, to dig with Dr. Britt down near Moab, Utah on some early Cretaceous, some Utah Raptor stuff down there. And I've had the opportunity to dig with Dr. Sheets in a similar region on some iguanodont and raptor and armored dinosaur stuff down there. I haven't been on a ton of digs. There's definitely other people at the museum who who go more frequently than I do. I've only been on digs like three times, I think, and and two of them were pretty short. But but it's it's a blast. It's a neat experience to be able to, to, to go out there and realize, hey, you know, this, whatever you find today, even if you work all day to, you know, find one knuckle bone, 
that's something that nobody else has seen before. It shut its eyes 120 million years ago, and, and you're the first eyes to see it since. And that's really neat to find it where it dropped dead, meaning that's also where it lived. <laughs> Again, it's not dead stuff. It's stuff that used to be alive, which I, doesn't sound like very much different, but I think it's an important distinction, and I think that's what makes it exciting. So how long do these digs usually last, and what do you have to do to prepare? You know, usually, and again, some of the ones I've been on have been shorter, but usually what happens is you go out for a week. Like I went out for a, a week in, in Moab with Dr. Sheets, well, near Moab, and basically you, you, it's like a big camping trip. You load up trucks in a trailer, and you go on a shopping trip to make sure that you've got all, all of your food. It's like a, a college road trip slash still going to work, <laughs> if that makes sense. We have the trailer out there to, to eat in. We have tents that everybody sleeps in. And, you know, you wake up early in the morning and you walk out to the dig site. We can't park too terribly close to the dig site. So it's, you know, a good 45-minute walk up there, which is also part of why it's exciting there. It's really in places where people don't go that often. It's hot sometimes. I think when we were up there, it was like 104 degrees outside. And, yeah, it's, it's a really neat experience. You make good friends and you find cool stuff. Did you know ahead of time that this site would have something to find, or is that just you kind of had to get a little lucky? The particular site that we were working at was found by Jeff Higgerson, who's a, a fossil expert that's worked in the past for us as a, as a prospector. It's important in paleontology to kind of be familiar with two disciplines, biology and geology. The biology tells you how the animals lived and acted once you find them, but in order to find them, you need geology. You need to know how old the rock is and you need to have experience in, in where to look. So it was found by Jeff Higgerson looking around in, in a formation that he knew would contain animals of the right age. So that's the first step. But even then, it's just a lot of footwork, just wandering around in the desert for days and days until he finds something interesting on the surface. And, you know, if it's next to a hill, it's a good indication that it's starting to erode out of the hill and you can dig deeper and there's more. And usually when you find one, you found a bed where there's other stuff. And so we tend to come back to locations over and over again. And sometimes it's found by prospectors. Sometimes it's found by everyday people who just kind of notice something strange on the ground. You know, we've got our Mosasaur on display in the museum, Pronathodon. Uh, he was found by some teenagers in Colorado before he was dug up. They just noticed something kind of cool on the side of the road, and they phoned it into the museum. They came and checked it out, and it turned out to be this beautiful skeleton. So expertise helps, but most finds are luck. <laughs> So we'll post all these links onto our I Know Dino website, but you've got an impressive portfolio of images and videos, and you sent us a personal project, which is a cover for a fictional game imagining the Jurassic Park universe updated with what we know about dinosaurs today. What prompted that? And can you describe what the game might be? Yeah, you know, actually, <laughs> there's a forum called JurassicWorld.org, and I have to admit, as much as I might disagree with not putting the feathers on the raptor, I am still super excited for the movie. So I was following this forum, and I noticed that there was a contest for, hey, design your own Jurassic World game cover, you know. And I thought, this could be fun, you know, and, I, and I'd been wanting an excuse for a while to kind of redesign some of the Jurassic Park stuff with up-to-dates to modern scientific understanding. And so I sat down and thought, okay, what would be fun for me in a Jurassic World game? That's kind of where the idea came from. And it's and again, it's a fictional game. It's not coming out anytime soon unless somebody wants to, you know, send me a couple million dollars to be able to fund a team to build it. But <laughs> it's just for fun. But it, it's uh, it's called Jurassic World Skeleton Crew, and the idea is, in, since in, in this new movie, you know, the old company that built Jurassic Park went bankrupt, and they were bought by a new company that wants to rebuild Jurassic World. The thing is, Jurassic World has been lying, or Jurassic Park is being overgrown and overrun by dinosaurs for the last twenty years. And they've got the run of the island, the jungle's taken over, and they're breeding, so there's more dinosaurs than when they left. And so before you can rebuild Jurassic World, you have to kind of tame the island. And the biggest concern, as we learned in all three films, really, is the raptors. Now, you can run away from a T-Rex, but at least it can't open the door after you come inside very easily. You know, but these raptors can't. And so the idea is that you're a part of a small group of people who have gone in and are being employed by the company to go in and capture all of the raptors before they can send a reconstruction crew. So you explore every part of the island, and you hunt and are hunted is kind of the idea. And I put feathers on the raptor and, and put his wrist position in the right place to update it. Well, it sounds fun. If you ever get to build it, please let us know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, one last question. What is your favorite dinosaur? You know, as a kid, it was always Allosaurus. He's actually the Utah State dinosaur, so nice to be working in Utah for that. But it's kind of shifted around a bunch lately. I think at the moment, it's probably Ultrasaurus, which was discovered again by Jim Jensen. And that one's actually under debate. There's some people who say that it's a, uh, just another, a very large Brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus is cool, too. But yeah, I just think the, the Brachiosaurus are beautiful, graceful animals, and I think I get the goosebumps every time I walk by a, a mounted skeleton of one. So, Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for taking the time and inviting me on the show. So as Josh Cotton mentioned, his favorite dinosaur is Ultrasaurus. So our combo weird dinosaurs of the day are going to be Ultrasaurus slash Ultrasauros. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, it probably shouldn't until I explain what happened. So Ultrasaurus means ultra reptile, and it was originally described as Ultrasaurus by Jim Jensen back in 1979. Jim Jensen had used the name Ultrasaurus Macintoshi as a nonum nudum, which is a Latin term meaning naked name, and it's mostly used in taxonomy specifically to mean a scientific name for an animal that hasn't been published or described completely yet. So Jim Jensen started talking about some fossils that he found in 1979 and describing them as Ultrasaurus macintoshi. Jim Jensen didn't publish his findings until 1985. Meanwhile, in Korea, a man named Hong Mook Kim had described what he thought was a very similar dinosaur and also called it Ultrasaurus. In his case... He called it Ultrasaurus tabriensis. So Kim published his findings about what his dinosaur was back in 1983 and used the same name, as I said, believing that they would be in the same genus. Then in 1985, when Jim Jensen published his Ultrasaurus, it was determined that they weren't related enough to share the same genus so they needed to use different names. So what Jensen did was he changed the name to Ultrasauros. One of Jensen's peers had actually suggested that he rename the dinosaur Jensenosaurus, but he really didn't like that. I guess he was attached to Ultrasaurus, so he came up with the Ultrasauros idea instead. So when Jim Jensen described his Ultrasaurus, slash Ultrasauros, he described a dorsal vertebrae as well as a large scapulocoracoid, and that's basically a shoulder bone. So he believed that this large vertebrae was part of an incredibly large dinosaur, thus the Ultrasaurus, and that the shoulder bone was larger than anything that had been found in a Brachiosaurus, despite being a similar style, so that they probably belong to the same species of large sauropod. Ultimately, Jim Jensen used the dorsal vertebrae that he discovered as the holotype for his Ultrasauros macintoshi. So the holotype is the bone that identifies the species in archaeology. So because of that, all the future discussion of Ultrasauros macintoshi is based specifically on that bone, not on the shoulder bone, which he later added into what he thought was Ultrasauros. So his peers at Brigham Young University published a paper that they called A Reassessment of Ultrasauros Macintoshi in 1996. So they basically outlined exactly what they thought about the fossil specifically BYU-9044, which is that particular dorsal vertebrae, as well as the shoulder bone, which is the uh, specimen BYU-9462. So when they looked at the dorsal vertebrae, they decided that it really looked just like a supersaurus vertebrae. And in fact, it was discovered in the same area of the Dry Mesa Quarry 
in the Morrison Formation of Western Colorado, where Jim Jensen had earlier discovered Supersaurus. So it's a kind of mistake that you might expect to be able to make. There is a lot of debate about what part of the back the vertebrae came from. Some people say it was near the pelvis, some people say it was near the head, and then everything in between. But it appears that most people agree that it was, in fact, a dorsal vertebrae. Because the Ultrasaurus holotype dorsal vertebrae has been now assigned to Supersaurus, Ultrasaurus macintoshi is now considered to be a subjective junior synonym of Supersaurus. And that basically just means that if you ever say Ultrasaurus macintoshi, that just means you're talking about Supersaurus. As I mentioned, those same peers also looked at the shoulder bone that Jim Jensen had described along with the vertebrae. And what they decided was that that shoulder bone could have definitely come from a Brachiosaurus. So Jim Jensen's original statements about that shoulder bone and why it belonged with the dorsal vertebrae was that that shoulder bone was much larger than any Brachiosaurus shoulder bone. But when they looked in more depth, they found that other mounted Brachiosaurus branchi shoulder bones were actually larger, so it didn't make sense to say that this had to have come from another species because it was so much bigger than anything that had ever been seen in Brachiosaurus because, in fact, there are examples of Brachiosaurus shoulder bones that are even larger than this. That fossil is now just considered another example of a Brachiosaurus shoulder bone and, as I mentioned, Ultrasaurus macintoshi is just considered another name for Supersaurus. It seems like if he had called the holotype of Ultrasaurus that shoulder bone, then Ultrasaurus would just be a subjective junior synonym for Brachiosaurus, and that vertebrae would just be a misclassified Supersaurus vertebrae. But that's not what he did. <laughs> On to the Ultrasaurus, as it is currently known. So Ultrasaurus was discovered, as we said, by Kim back in Korea in the 1980s, and he believed that it had to be an enormous dinosaur because he thought that the bone that he found was a giant ulna, which is the lower arm bone, but it turned out to be a partial humerus, which is a bone that is larger in these dinosaurs. So that threw off all of his calculations on the perceived size of Ultrasaurus. Kim named the species of his Ultrasaurus, Ultrasaurus tabriensis, as we said earlier. But there isn't enough known about that fossil to put it into a specific sauropod family, so it is only classified in the Neosauropoda clad. So Ultrasaurus lived in the Cretaceous period about 110 to 100 million years ago in what is now Korea. But some scientists are calling Ultrasaurus a nomen dubium, which means doubtful name in Latin. And that basically means that because there's only a partial bone found, they're not really convinced that it is its own species. This was further exacerbated when they discovered that the bone put it more in the range of other sauropods rather than being so large that it was unlikely to be one of the previously discovered sauropods. So it's a little bit unclear where Ultrasaurus would sit in the family tree or if it's just an already known sauropod. So to summarize, the Ultrasaurus described by Jensen is what is referred to in paleontology as a chimera, and that means a fossil that's reconstructed by elements from different species, so the shoulder bone of a Brachiosaurus and the spinal vertebrae of a Supersaurus. And the Ultrasaurus that was described by Kim in Korea may not be its own species, depending on who you ask, because there's still quite a bit of uncertainty around that fossil. So that's the long story of Ultrasaurus slash Ultrasauros, and... It's a little bit unfortunate that it may not have been its own dinosaur at all, depending on who you ask. But it's always interesting. There were a few sources that I found, old news articles about Ultrasaurus, and 
it's always sensationalized where people talk about it could be the new largest dinosaur, look how huge it was, and then they always seem to shrink as the research gets published and they look more in depth at what the bones actually meant and how much meat would have actually been on that dinosaur. At least we always learn something from these things, even if it isn't a new largest dinosaur. So our fun fact of the day is that sauropods had an especially low encephalization quotient. And the encephalization quotient, or EQ, you can think of as just a super big ballpark guess at how smart an animal might have been. It's essentially just a ratio of the mass of a brain to the mass of the animal. So a human is about a seven and a half, a dolphin is about a four, a chimpanzee is about a two and a half, a dog is about a 1.2, an elephant can range between 1.2 and 2.4, and a rat is about a 0.4. But unfortunately for those sauropods, they were about a 0.2 on the scale. And of all the dinosaurs, it looks like they were about as low as it gets. Even the stegosaurus that we've mentioned, not being that intelligent, was about a 0.6 on the scale. So, poor sauropods. There was a big point in the spinal column near the tail that scientists used to think was a secondary brain, but now it's typically just referred to as an enlargement in the spinal cord. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you like what you've heard, please leave us a review on iTunes. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.